in 14.7 that I started last time, and we weren't coming up with the same answer that we got when we did the, uh, the, the which version did we do? I forget which version we did. Um, I can tell you after. Uh, we did the circulation method, so Stokes theorem. We have a boundary, and then we have a surface. And when we did the boundary, we ended up with minus 4 pi. But then when I integrated the normal component of the curl, I wasn't getting minus 4 pi. Did folks see this posted? Yeah, I'm just there. Right, see that? So the blunder I made was this. There, you have to use the right normal vector. And, ouch, not too bad. And one thing, <coughs> I had this in my mind. I, I felt like it was wrong at the time, and I just kept going with it because of this. So to use, to use the right normal vector, you only have two choices. You have to parameterize your surface and use n equals excuse me, r sub u cross r sub b. You have to use that n if you parameterize your surface. And if your surface is given to you as a function, so we have something like that, then you can use, if you don't want to parameterize the surface, you can use this one. Minus z sub x minus z sub y plus 1. And we had just done a problem earlier where I made a comment. We had a, there was a plane or something. It was, I forget exactly what it was. But it was something like that. And notice this. If you were to uh, use the second normal here, minus z sub x minus z sub y comma 1, you would choose this. You would say z sub x is 2, so you would have minus 2, minus 3, 1. Right? And if you parameterize that surface, which is a plane, if you parameterize it, you would parameterize it as r equals x comma y comma, or if we use these and these like the book uses, we would say u comma v comma what? 2u plus 3v, if we were to parameterize it. And then we would go through this process, we get r sub u, we would get r sub b, and we cross them, and when you cross them, your first component is 0 minus 2, and lo and behold, you get the same exact thing. <clears throat> okay, so those are the only two ways you can find your normal. You can either be given the surface as a function and use minus zx minus uy1, or you parameterize your surface and use ru cross rv. And what we notice with this surface here, if we did it either way, we get the same normal. And the mistake I made was that when I looked at that, I said, oh, we just used the gradient and it worked fine. And so with that other surface that we had, I think it was a sphere, the gradient was 2x, 2y, 2z. That won't work. That won't work. You have to use either that end or the parameterized one. <coughs> the gradient just so happens to work if you have a surface written as function. Then you can say, oh yeah, the gradient does work. But it's only that one special case that the gradient works. So if you have a non-functional surface, like a sphere, the gradient is 2x, 2y, 2z, that will not work. You have to do r sub u cross r sub v, or you have to use minus z sub x minus z sub y1. Okay, so that's why I came up with a different answer, because I used the wrong normal. So on, the, on D2L, I posted the complete solution using both, showing that you get minus 4 pi, whether you use minus z sub x minus z sub y comma 1, or whether you use r sub u cross r sub u. So that one's posted. So let's do a couple more from Stokes theorem to make sure that we get this down pat. So number 10, we want to, again, verify that we get the same uh, answer using both the surface integral and the line integral. 
And we started to do this at the end of class. I think I actually finished one piece of it. I can't remember which piece. Doesn't matter what we did right now. So we're talking about the plane z equals six minus y that lies inside the cylinder. So the curve C would be the boundary here, the blue curve. And that's what our that's what our surface looks like. It's just that tilted disk, that tilted ellipse. If we use the double integral, that means we're using the surface. So we'd have to parameterize the surface. To parameterize the plane, we're going to do it just like we just did on the previous slide. If we're parameterizing that plane, we're going to let x be u, y be v, and then z is 6 minus y, which means 6 minus v. Do your crisscross, and you get that r sub u cross r sub v is 0, 1, 1. Now, like I just said, this happens to be a surface that's also a function, so the gradient would work here. So if you did add this variable y to the other side, your gradient would be 0, 1, 1, and that matches, right? So it's only when the surface happens to be a function that the gradient can also be used as the normal vector. And it's because in that special case, r sub u cross r sub v and the gradient are actually the same when you have a surface being the other function. The curl, 2, 1, 0. You know how to find the curl just by now. Find using the determinant. So if we're going to do the, the double integral over the inside here, the, the surface integral over that inside, we're going to do the double integral of curl dotted with n vs, which is the same thing as the double integral of curl dotted with that vector right there. Actually. Um, let me let me just plug, plug those things in instead of using a bunch of space rewriting the same formula. So curl is going to be two one zero dotted with the normal vector, and then this will be over dA over the surface over the domain. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, so we found our normal vector. We found our ooh, that's good. we found our curl, and we just got the DNA. So let's be clear: this integral with the ds is over the surface. That's over this thing, the tilted plane. As soon as we use that normal vector in one of the two possible ways, then it's over the region R, which is down here in the xy plane. So as soon as we substitute in that normal vector, then it's over dA. Then we evaluate it. So dotting that all together, where do we get? It's like this one, right? So that's nothing more than the area of R. The area of R, that's a circle of radius 4. So that's pi R squared, that's 16 pi. So that should be the final answer there, using the double integral, using the surface integral. <coughs> so that's the surface integral. Now let's confirm that we get the same thing if we use the line integral around the boundary. So the double integral over the inside should equal the single integral around the outside. We would have to parameterize our curve if we're going to, the curve is down here. We have to parameterize, uh, actually, I said parameterize, well, yeah, this will lead us to it. <coughs> So if we're going to do the single integral around the outside, that's a parameterization of the circle. That's really not exactly where we need to go. But it's pretty easy to get to the parameterization of C. So there's a parameterization of the curve in the xy plane. How do we get the parameterization of C? What would that be? Value. Right? 
So this parameterization of the curve down here, that puts us right below the ellipse up there. So the only thing left to do is then add a z component to that. Right? So the parameterization of the curve in the domain, that gets us to the right lateral location. And then we just have to go up. So we would add a z component. So we're going to have 4 cosine t, 4 sine t. And then the z component is 6 minus y. So that will be 6 minus 4 sine of t. Exactly. And the r prime that we really need to evaluate this, this line as well is related to that r prime, but we have another component. So we're going to have minus 4 sine t, 4 cosine t. And then the derivative of that third component is minus 4 cosine t. So this is the parameterization of the ellipse. Okay. So to do a line integral, integral of f dr, we're going to do this evaluation technique where we take um, the vector field, which is minus, that's the vector field. We've parameterized our curve. We have an x expression in t, a y expression in t, a z expression in t. We're only dealing with a single integral, so we can only deal with a single letter of integration. So those components get subbed into the vector field to turn the vector field into a field that depends only on t. The only way we can integral, integrate a single integral is if there's only one letter, one variable. So all those have to be subbed in. So our field is going to be minus y, so that's minus four sine t. The next component is minus x minus z. So minus x minus z. The next component is y minus x. Here, so 4 sine t minus 4 cosine t. And then we dot that. The curve is from 0 to 2 pi, so we dot that with the parameterization of, our, of uh, the curve's derivative. So we dot that with minus 4 sine t, 4 cosine t, and minus 4 cosine t. So to evaluate FBR, you've got F <coughs> with R prime. Yeah? Isn't the first portion of the cosine of the line? This should be minus Y. Four, so minus 4 sine theta. Yeah. No, sir. Everybody follow that? So we're taking the components X, Y, Z and plugging it into the X, Y, Z. Really easy to get R and R prime sort of jumbled a little bit. And just make sure that this is our prime and not our here. Make sure that's our prime. And now we have a single integral with uh, just integral variable of t. <laughs> okay, so we end up with 16 sine squared plus 16 cosine squared. Uh, there's going to be some simplification for sure, so we like that right off the bat. So plus 16. Oh, it says minus though. That's plus, that's minus 16. <coughs> oh, I think that is way too big. Way too big. Way too big. Way too big. Way so negative 16 cosine squared. T uh, minus 24. Cosine of t plus 16 sine cosine. And then minus 16 sine cosine. There's our plus 16 cosine squared. You have to do something. Simplify that. <coughs> so 
cancellation. Those two go away. And we have uh, 16 for the sine squared plus cosine squared. So I think we're down to 16 minus 16 cosine squared of t minus 24 cosine t. Are you going to see anything funny? Signs all the right. Yeah? Is there a reason you wouldn't want to take the 16, the negative 16 cosine squared or the 16 cosine squared of the cosine? No. No. You mean factor that out? Uh, well, like in the step above. Yep. Uh, second term there and then the last term are opposites. You could just oh. <laughs> oh, yeah, we could do that. <laughs> that works fun. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, good point. No reason we can't do that. Yeah, we could absolutely just cancel those out. And this right here, right, one minus two times squared times squared. Good point. Good point. Yeah, that absolutely works. Totally funny. So here, uh, if we want to do that, we can combine these two into just 16 times squared. These two. That actually seems a little easier to integrate, so we might as well do that. So we're going to write that as 16 sine squared, but then we're going to write sine squared as 1 half minus 1 half cosine of 2t. Minus 24 cosine t. We're too determined to look for a Pythagorean identity, I guess. So integrating this with respect to t, we have 8 there, so that gives us 8t. Here we have minus 8 cosine, so we're going to get minus that's going to integrate to sine of 2t. And then we have to divide by 2, so that's going to put a 4 out here. And then we integrate this part, and we get minus 24 sine t. And t is 0 to 2. This gives us nothing, <coughs> this gives us nothing. And then we're left with something like that. Which is the same and we got the 65. Double integral over the inside is equal to single integral around the outside. Any question on any step there? Are we going to decide which one we use on the Yeah. Yeah, I won't ask you to verify. This is these early ones are just verification and then the next group. We will I will give you instructions kind of like this. So, uh, yeah. Um, I was just going to ask, I'm a little unclear on what exactly we're finding when we integrate this. When we take the, uh, it's called circulation. So it's called circulation. So the idea is that the circulation around the boundary, so that if we have positive circulation, that means that there's a net effect of rotation going this direction using the right hand rule. If we had negative circulation, it would be a net effect going the other way. And the idea is that integrating the normal component of the curl, the curl is what contributes to the rotation, and integrating the normal component of the curl on the inside builds up exactly what's happening on the edge. So again, that paddle wheel analogy, if you imagine all the little paddle wheels on the inside, Though the net effect of all those create a circulation around the boundary. So they call it circulation. Stokes theorem here, they say evaluate the single integral by evaluating the surface integral. So here they're saying don't do the single integral, do the double integral over the inside, it's easier. So we've got a vector field. We've got this ellipse that's hovering at a height of 1 above the xy plane. Okay. So if we're going to do the double integral, we have to parameterize the surface. If we're doing a single integral, we have to parameterize the boundary. So here they say to evaluate the single using double, that means we have to parameterize the surface. So the parameterization of the surface <coughs> The surface is equal to 1. Okay. The ellipse is the boundary of the surface. The surface, though, is equal to 1, and then the it's constrained by the ellipse down in the xy plane. 
So that is our surface as a function, and we have two choices. We could say, oh, that surface is a function. Let's use minus z sub x minus z sub y comma 1. Look at that. Or we say, oh, let's parameterize it. We would pr parameterize the surface like this, 0, 0, 1. Right? That's the parameterization of the <coughs> surface. the single vector, that's not the surface. The surface has to be the whole plane. So what did I, what am I missing there? What should it be? When we parameterize the surface, we usually have u's and v's in there. Because we need two variables to move and get a two-dimensional surface. So we need a couple of variables to get all those ordered purples. So what should u and v, what should x and y be? U and v. U and v. <coughs> right? That that is the, the surface z equals 1. You go wherever you want, uv, and then you go up 1. Right? The uv takes you <laughs> away from the origin in the horizontal and vertical direction, and then we go up. So that would be, and we'll notice that if we do this, we're going to get the same exact normal, which is, again, the point. So when you cross these two together, so again, in this case, there was a shortcut because the surface happened to be a function. If the surface happens to be a function, you can use z sub x, z sub y, minus uh, comma 1. Minus z sub x, minus z sub y, comma 1. <coughs> okay. So we're using the double integral. So we're doing the double integral over the surface of the normal component of the curl, dx. So that is evaluated by finding the curl, again, with the determinant, and we get that pretty easily with the determinant. So we have to dot that with this. So we dot those two together. As soon as we dot those two together, we're not going over the surface anymore. We're going over the domain down in the xy plane. So this is now over r. When we dot that together, we can get v minus 1. This is a double integral, x's and y's, over our region in the xy plane. We have a z in there, so what do we have to do with the z? Make it a 1. Because on that surface, z is always 1. Right? We're on that surface where z is always 1, so we end up with double integral of 0 over r, so this one is 0. Okay, so double integral of the inside gives us 0. And if we did the line integral, we'd get the same thing. Now, this one doesn't seem that complicated to do the line integral. They told us to do the double. Mm -hmm. If we were going to do the line integral, instead of parameterizing the surface, so there's the surface, instead, if we were going to do the line integral, we would parameterize the curve. And how, anyone know how to parameterize the curve? So this curve is in the <coughs> so this curve is in the plane z equals one. That's an, uh, an ellipse that's floating. <coughs> if you did want to parameterize the curve, it would have to be a single variable because it's a curve. Any ideas? Uh, the curve is Definitely comma one. But how would you do it? How would you do a circle? If you're parameterizing a circle. Oh, yeah, yeah. R cosine theta, R sine theta, or U cosine G, U sine B. So we do that kind of thing. Uh, we would just have to be wary of that first coordinate there, or excuse me, the coefficient for the for the Y thing would be a little different. What would the coefficient for the Y thing be? <coughs> So 
If we wanted to check that, let's use the Pythagorean identity. We're letting x be cosine of u. We're letting y be one half sine of b. Uh, I should use the same letter there, though, and that should, those should be both u's. So it's better to use the And I actually, what letter do we normally use when we're doing a curve? D. Better use that. Better use <laughs> So if we parameterize, if we make that parameterization, how do we check that we have the right thing? Well, cosine squared plus sine squared is 1. So cosine squared plus sine squared is 1. Let's see if we did it right. So we did x squared. Sine squared is actually going to be 4y squared equals 1. So did we do it right? Is that the same? No. So what do we do with that coefficient? What should it be? So let's try the reciprocal of that. You have to check. If it's not absolutely obvious, you always just check. So if we put a 2 in there, then sine of t is y over 2, and y over 2 squared is y squared over 4. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So that's the parameterization of the curve. And then we would find the derivative of our curve, and you could go from there. So your next step would be to dot that uh, thing up there, the function, the field, with R prime, FDR. Okay. So we've got those two together. And Hager and Zoom. Didn't ask us to do that, we don't need to do that. That's just if they wanted us to. All right, let's do another one. So in 13, we've got another plane. They're only asking about what's happening in the first octant. So let's do a quick sketch of what's happening in octant one. What are the Z, what's the Z-intercept that we're dealing with? Four? How about the X-intercept and the Y-intercept? What? Clear? Louder? Fours, right? All fours? If you let x and y be 0, z is 4. If you let x and z be 0, y is 4. If you let y and z be 0, x is 4. So all of them are 4. So that the surface that we're looking at is this triangle, that face of the tetrahedron. So c is the boundary of the plane in the first octet. Okay. If we were going to do the line integral, we'd have to do three separate line integrals. Okay. We would have to parameterize each of the three segments, like that. Find the three derivatives, integrate the three at the x. But again, the instructions here say use the double integral. Double integral, we can do it all in one fell swoop. We find the curl of our function with the determinant. Okay. And then there's our surface, z. Oh, it happens to be given to us as a function. So we have two choices. We can parameterize it like this, u, v, 4 minus u minus v, find r sub u and r sub v and cross them. But because our surface is given to us as a function, we could also use minus e sub x, minus e sub y, comma 1, and we get the same exact form. Okay, so then the goal of this question was to integrate the, the curl <coughs> of the function dotted with n over the surface. So as soon as we substitute in that n right there, the 1, 1, 1, then this becomes a dA. And is everybody clear why that is? Remember that NDS is really this. N is R sub U cross R sub V. That's a normal, this is a unit normal up here. 
divided by the length of our sub u cross r sub v. And d sub s is the magnitude of r sub u cross r sub v dA. Actually, I think I'm just remembering that this book only uses one. No, it only uses one, right? Yeah. yeah. All the old books use two. <coughs> it's a new thing to know this one. So ds is that. N is this unit normal right there. But it's not the principal normal. It's just a unit normal and usually outward. So curl right there. We need to plop that into our integral here. We're going to be going over dA, and there's a z in there. We have to deal with that z. So what what should we do with the z? What's going to go into that z? So z, we're dealing with our surface. That's right. Dealing with our surface. So that's up there. Four minus x minus y. So we're going to have minus 4 times 4 minus x minus y, comma 0. And then we're going to dot that with our unit normal, or not our unit normal, but just our normal here. 1, 1, 1. That will be dA over r. Okay, so then we got those together, and we will have a pretty simplified integral. So R, let's just leave it as R for a minute. We have to go down and look at that triangle down there. Let's just get this clean up first. So we have two zeros. That's nice. All we have is that middle term. So we end up with minus 4. It can go all the way to the front of the multiplier. And then on the inside, we have 4 minus x minus y. Now we just have to figure out that triangle. So let's let's just move. Let's put the triangle. Let's graph it in the x-y plane just to make sure we're not making any sign errors. We have y-intercept and x-intercept of four, so we would have to figure out whether we want a vertical element or a horizontal, probably just choose a vertical. And what's the equation of this line right here? Yeah, negative x plus 4. Right, y intercepts 4, so it's negative 1. So we're going to integrate dy dx. x is going to be from the constant interval that's on the top side, 0 to 4. And then y is on the inside, it's going to go from 0 up to 4 minus x, or minus x plus 4. Integrate with respect to y. So, yeah, let's just multiply this all out. Almost there. Combine our like terms. And for like terms, get the squares done first. We end up with half x squared. No. X. You, you went from negative x minus 4 to 4 minus x, or just kind of positive 4? Yeah. So that's going to work. Where here? Where? No. No. Yeah, from 0. Oh, that should be a plus right there? Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. So that's right, that's right, and then the middle term is negative. That's the only spot right there. Oh, 
those two are at Yeah. These two here? Yeah. Oh, because I plugged that in. Oh, yeah. So, that one's still negative 4, so that one becomes negative, oh, that one is negative 4x though, right? It's just that that part there is awesome. positive 16, and then that part's positive x squared, and that is minus 4x there. So the x squared is still combined properly. All right, and then that's going to be negative 8x, and then that's going to be plus 4x, and we end up with negative 4x. And then the constants, we have 16 minus 8, so plus 8. That's right. And then, of course, we just finish this thing off. Oops, x. Here. Cubed over 3, so that's 1 over 6. X cubed minus 2 x squared plus x equals 4. 4 times 4 is 16. 16 times 4 is 64, so 32 thirds. And 16 times 2. Sixty-four times sixty-four. No, what? Thirty-two. Eight times four. Thirty-two. Thirty-two. All right. So we end up with minus one hundred twenty-eight thirds. That tells us the direction of the circulation. So the net effect is what? The, we, and the way we know is we have to make sure when we look at our normal vector, that normal vector is in the general up direction because the z is positive. So that's this outward normal this way. So positive circulation would be going this direction, matching the upward normal. We got negative circulation, so the net effect is this direction. Yeah, so okay. it, it just goes opposite of what the orientation determined by your normal vector is. Okay. So that normal that we chose is outward. If we would have chose negative 1, negative 1, negative 1, that would have been kind of down and in. Then we would have had, with respect to that normal, positive circulation. Positive circulation, we would put our thumb in the direction of the normal that we chose, so that would tell us it's going this way also. Okay. So if it was positive, so it just depends on the direction of the normal. With surfaces, you can't always, you can't say, if, unless the surface is closed, you can't say outward normal and have it make any sense. Just kind of like the right hand rule, right? You always have to use the right hand rule. Okay. All right, let's do one more of these things. So here it says step serum with the uh, so here it says use the line integral to find the double. So instead of using the double to simplify the line, they want us to use the line to simplify the double. And again, maybe the double's not so bad, who knows? We could find out if we wanted it, but it, it's asking us to do the line integral. So first thing, they tell us that we're going to use this field, r divided by the length of r. So we've got that field. And that field is, is being applied to the surface here. So the surface is within that field, excluding the base. We have to exclude the base when we're talking about Stokes theorem because we need a boundary. When we get into the divergence theorem, then we're imagining a closed surface so that base is included as part of the surface. But with Stokes theorem, it's got to be open. Got to be an edge. So the paraboloid, 9 minus y squared minus z squared. So that paraboloid, if you imagine y and x are being, if you imagine y and z being 0, you get this. If y and z are 0, 
x is 9, and I didn't draw the whole paraboloid, it's out here 9. Okay, so you're imagining the paraboloid kind of like that. You know, it's intersection with the with the yz plane. If you let x be 0, you get y squared plus z squared equals 9. How do you want to put that on there? It's really messy. So the paraboloid is going you know, down the x-axis. And it intersects the yz plane where x is 0, you get y squared plus z squared equals 9. That's the only part that's important to us. doesn't actually matter that it's a paraboloid. All we care about is that that is the boundary of the paraboloid. We're going to get the same exact answer if we had a hemisphere here, a cone, or whatever. That boundary is the only part that matters. And the surface that has that boundary, <coughs> doesn't matter what the surface is. The boundary is all that we care about. OK, so again, we're going to do the single integral, which means we have to parameterize the curve. For the double integral, you have to parameterize the surface. Single integral, parameterize the curve. So parameterizing the curve, so again, that boundary curve, if we look in the yz plane, we're letting x be 0. That's this circle of radius 3. So the parameterization would be 0, 3 cosine t, 3 sine t. So we're OK with that parameterization. So it's a little different just because x is 0. But in the yz plane, circle of radius 3. We take our field. The field is this crazy thing, r over length r, and they tell us that r is this radial vector, this vector that points in the x, y, z direction. So it's sort of emanating away from the origin. All these vectors. And they make it a unit vector. So we take r, x, y, z, divided by its length, the length of that vector, square root of the of the squares, now, we want that vector field applied only to that curve in the yz plane. And on the curve in the yz plane, that's what x is, that's what y is, and that's what z is. So we replace those in. We replace x with 0, y with 3 cosine, and z with 3 sine. And this denominator, right, does not just become 9 inside the square root. Square root of 9 is 3. 3 cancels, we get 0 cosine. So to evaluate the single integral, one letter of integration, we just need t. We're going to dot these two together. Zero cosine sine gets dotted with r prime, which is zero minus three sine. But the single integral, oh, and t is going from 0 to 2 pi. We dot those together, and we end up with minus 3 sine cosine plus 3 sine cosine. It's like 0. It looks like you have. <coughs> yeah? I was wondering if the arm translation there, um, the cosine sine, it, it is possible, right, to have an inverse sine, the cosine inverse thing has a different one with the t. Like it could be 0, 3, 5, and t, it could be cosine t, and then t would go from 5 out of the Yeah, you absolutely could do that. Yeah, any parameterization will give you the same result. So you could do that parameterization. And you can parameterize it, you can it from like this, but 2 pi to 4 pi. You know, lots of different ways to do it. Yeah, reversity. <coughs> I mean, yeah, in, in this case, the orientation is the only thing we have to be a little concerned with. And they told us up here that n points in, the, in an upward direction. So that means we just have to make sure we're picking the right normal vector. 
And so when we pick the right normal vector here, so we've got this paraboloid here, n is essentially the outward normal for that paraboloid. And when n is the outward normal, that means that we're trying to find the circulation in this direction. So as long as that all lines up with the parameterization you choose, then it doesn't matter what, which one you pick. So here, we have to get that. So, you know, it would be interesting to ask here with this vector field. So there's our vector field right there. Let's see, there before we uh, plug in the parameterization. If we were going to do the surface integral, we would be integrating the normal component of the curl. So we'd have to find the curl of this field. Uh, this here kind of tells us, well, maybe the vector field uh, is a conservative vector field. And it's kind of implying that it might be a conservative vector field. So we get a zero there. Because the double integral will be the double integral of the curl dotted with NDS. So if this was a conservative vector field, the curl would be zero and we'd get an answer of zero. This doesn't guarantee that the curl that the conservative that it's a conservative vector field the curl is zero. But that's something if you wanted, you could take the curl of that. I don't want to do that. But you could find the curl of that, and if the curl of that is zero, then you know the conservative field. Mm -hmm. so one more of these guys, and we'll go to the last section. Um, all right, so in 19, we've got a vector field, and here we're dealing with S, the surface, that's the cap of the sphere excluding its base, so sphere of radius 5, but we're going to let z or x go from 3 to 5. So everyone picturing the surface? So we've got this sphere of radius 5. If we imagine the x-axis is coming out this way, we're talking about a cap like that, a front cap, where x is going 3 to 5. Right? So the front cap of the sphere. And they just say exclude the base because we're doing Stokes' theorem where we have to have a boundary. And if we wanted to include the base where we have that kind of thing, hemispherish like thing with a you know, base, then we'd be talking about the divergence there, which is for the next section. So here we've got this sort of open surface. Got an edge. Okay. So. When we are trying to find that boundary, that occurs when x is 3. Okay, so we're going to plug in 3 for that x right there. Does that make sense? If we plug in the 5, where are we? We're at that little button on top of the cap, right? If we plug in 5, we're at the, that spot right there. So plug in 3 is going give, to give us that ring, or that circle. Okay, so for the variables, isolate the variables, we see that the circle of radius 4. And that circle of radius 4 is floating out there at z equals 3. It's not in the yz plane. It's up there, x equals 3. <coughs> so now let's parameterize it. Well, we know how to parameterize the circle of radius 4, 4 cosine, 4 sine, but the x component is 3 because we're, you know, we're out 3 units from the yz plane. So x is 3 for all points on that circle. So we do x3, the 4 cos, 4 sine. Take the derivative. Oh, that's a terrible derivative. That's a terrible derivative. That's, let's get rid of that. The bogus derivative. Derivatives. Make up your own derivative. Pick your own derivative. So there's our derivative. There's our derivative. And if we're going to use the line arrow, we're then going to take 
the components of the parameterization and plug them into the field. So if we plug in the components, our field is going to look like 2y. Let's see. So it's 2 times y and it's from r, not r prime. So 2 times 4 cosine, that's 8 cosine of t, comma, minus z, that's going to be negative 4 sine of t, comma, x minus y minus z, x minus y minus z, we dot that with our prime, and then we integrate with respect to t. And of course, and did it say something about? Just says n points in the relative upward direction. Um, so one thing we just want to make sure is that if we have that cap out there that we're looking at. And then this point in the relative upward direction, that's kind of a little bit, yeah, no, no question. It's kind of a little misleading because there's a spherical cap there, and that end is pointing, pointing up and into the x direction. Yeah, that's exactly, you know, the only way we could interpret it to make any sense, is that it's pointing, which the way they, that's not really what, that's not really, I mean, that's how we should interpret it for sure, but it's a little, a little, little goofy. Um, that being the case, so we would want to be making sure that our parameterization is going around this direction. And that's what we chose, actually, right? Four cosine, four sine, it's counterclockwise. We're looking at the board. So we got these two vectors together, and it looks like, ooh, zero. We like that. Alright, then 16 sine squared. Sixteen sine squared and then not zero. Not, <laughs> not zero. Twelve cosine t and then minus sixteen cosine squared. And then minus sixteen sine t cosine t alright let's combine with the double angle identity these two can combine we have a double angle identity it says cosine squared minus sine squared is what equals what cosine 2t so cosine 2t, cosine squared minus sine squared. So this minus is backwards, so we just have to make sure we don't blow it. So when we combine those, we're going to have minus what? Say again. Minus 16, everybody agree? Minus 16. So cosine, cosine 2t is that, so we have minus 16 cosine and plus 16 sine, so yeah, okay. And then plus 12 cosine of 1t, and then plus 16 sine. So we can integrate this term by term pretty easily. Minus 8 sine of 2t. That one plus 12 sine of and then this last one you could change it to a sine of 
sine of two t thing if you want, but you can integrate with substitution here. There's u is sine and du is cosine, so it's going to be u squared over two, where u is sine, so we're going to get minus eight sine squared. Zero to two pi. That gives nothing. He's floating up there like an Get down. Down And how about other one? This contributes nothing also, right? That doesn't contribute much either. <laughs> 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 on the exam, <laughs> if you come across a huge CF, write zero. Okay. All right, so here we can zero again. Oh boy. So this again was the line of circulation. So we didn't do the double integral, we just did the single integral. This field's not too hard to find the curl of. You know, we What's that? Seems like an easier to Yeah, yeah. Well, my, if it's if this is a conservative vector field, it definitely is easier because the curl would be zero and would be done. <laughs> so let's let's just check because this one's easy. So let's just check the curl of this one. So to check the curl, we're gonna have i j and k up top, and then we partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y, partial with respect to z, two y minus z x minus y minus z. We're just curious. Let's just see what the curl of the thing is. Uh, so that's negative 1 plus 1, 0. That's out partial distance with respect to x. That's 1. Yeah, that's not actually, it's not conservative. Either. Partial of that's 1 with respect to x. Minus the partial of that with respect to z is 0, and then we change the sign. And then that component is 0 minus 2, so negative 2. Yeah, so it's not. So it probably would be about the same work. Not consistent. All right, let's take a break, and then we'll do uh, the last section. Last section. Yay. Like I was just talking to Henry about the Stokes' theorem is a generalization of Green's circulation theorem. And the divergence theorem is a generalization of Green's flux theorem. So with Green's theorem in two-dimensional space, the, one, the piece that we just did with Stokes, you know, instead of going around the boundary in the xy plane, now we just have a curve, I mean a surface, in free space where we go around the boundary. So you just took the plane z equals zero and lifted it and twisted it. You know, so the same thing is true for the flux version. We, we still are going to have this closed boundary, it's just now that we have a solid object. So the boundary is the shell, if you will, of the object. And uh, <coughs> so here's the divergence there. And it's just simply saying that the, the, actually they say it really nicely in words here, down at the bottom. So they say, the way they write statements, I thought it was really clear. So the surface integral on the left, so that's the surface integral, and our only assumption right here is that we have a closed surface. And a lot of times you'll see uh, like some indicator on these integrals, just like when we were dealing with a closed curve, they put a circle. Sometimes they'll do that with a double integral also, they'll put a circle through it, this one doesn't do it. But it indicates that the surface is closed. So here we're going to do a double integral on the surface, and it's going to be equal to a triple integral on the inside. The only difference is that what's on the inside, we're looking at the divergence. So del dot f is the divergence of that. So the way you should think of this is that this is measuring the flux through the boundary, through the surface. That flux is equal to what's leaving the inside. The divergence is measuring what's leaving the inside. And so that there just says what's leaving the inside matches what's going through the surface. So that's what that says. And the way they say it here is pretty clear. The surface integral on the left gives the flux of the vector field across the boundary. Positive flux integral means that there is net flow 
out of the region. The triple integral on the right uh, is the cumulative expansion or contraction of the vector field over D. So if the vector field is contracting, you have negative flux. More vector field, more is coming, net flow is in instead of out. Positive, that means there's more flow out than in. So the triple on the right is cumulative expansion or contraction of the vector field. Over, the, over D means throughout the whole solid region D. So D is a solid object. And S is just the, the boundary of that solid object, the shell of it. <coughs> And divergence theorems generally a lot easier than Stokes theorem simply because divergence is so simple to find. Curl is a little bit of a pain to find. With divergence, partial of the x component with respect to x, partial of the y component with respect to y, partial of the z component with respect to z. Divergence is a is a function. It's not a vector field. The curl is another vector. So that just makes it a little more complicated. Divergence is, is easier in some of those. Now this problem in particular, I wouldn't say it's super easy because what are we dealing with here? So it says evaluate the divergence. So let's do the triple of the solid, the double of the surface, and look at this solid object here. It's got six faces. So this is gonna be very similar to the one that you were talking about with that temperature function. And if we are gonna do the <coughs> surface integral here, we've gotta parameterize each of the surfaces and find a normal vector for each of the surfaces. Let's first do the triple integral, because that's going to be super easy. And if you are trying to find that, if you're trying to find flux, and you've got a solid box, <laughs> you definitely want to do the triple integral, so that you're not parameterizing six spaces and finding six normal vectors. Right, that's a pain in the neck. So if our goal is to find flux, let's treat it like a solid object and use the triple integral. So with Stokes there, we integrated the normal component of the curl. With the divergence there, we just integrate the divergence of this. So the triple integral here, so flux. A lot of what folks will refer to flux with a capital um, phi symbol. This book doesn't do it, so I won't do it. But you know, it's. I think that's it's good to have a symbol for it, but I they just don't do it, I'm not sure why. So the total flux then, we're going to use the triple integral over the solid object D. And because these are all constants, it doesn't matter which order we integrate in. So let's just go to dx, dy, to d. Put negative 1 to 1 on the outside, put negative 2 to 2 in the middle, negative 3 to 3. And then we're integrating the divergence. Oh, we can actually factor out a 2, pop a 2 to the front, and then I'd integrate x plus y plus z. So that would be the divergence theorem. And that's easy. Uh, what did I do? Oh, did I do it? Oh, yeah, yeah, I did that. Thanks. So z, dy, dx. Look at Although, because of the symmetry of that divergence, it didn't really matter. It was the same number anyway. But, yeah, that's definitely how we should do it. So, integrate with respect to x. Oh, maybe what I just said is the s. Okay, so, so the integrate with respect to z, we're going to get xz plus yz plus z squared over 2. Plugging in our limits for z. Let's see. So we're going to get three z here, and then minus negative three z. So we're going to get six. Or I should say x. We're going to plug by x. So six x. The middle term plugged in for z, we're going to get 3y minus minus 3y, so we're going to get 6y. And then the last term, we're going to get 9 halves minus 9 halves. So that part's going to go away, correct? Because that's the square. So that'll go away. And then we're left with the x.
integrate that with respect to y, let's pull out the same. So we have 12 out in front now. So we're going to integrate that with respect to y. So we have x times y plus y squared over 2. We do 2, 2. x. Plugging in for y, we have 2x minus <coughs> minus 2x, so that's 4x. <coughs> And then nothing, correct? Y squared, the 2 is 4 minus 4, so that's going to be 0. And the division by 2, same thing, just like that. So we end up with 4x dx. So 48 out in front, divided by 2, we get 24x squared minus 1 to 1. What does that give us? Zero. 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 A whole lot of work. A whole lot of work for a number with no magnitude. Okay, so that's the easier way. Just like with Stokes' theorem, often it's easier to do the double integral, um, you know, the surface integral instead of the boundary integral. Often. <laughs> Let's do the boundaries though. So. All right, let's, let's actually create a new slide and take it over to that new slide. And is this going to be a little bit of, oh, is it doing that thing again? Do you not get why it does that? Won't do it over here, but it does it on the board. At least I've learned how to get around it. Equations, right? Yeah, Maxwell's equations are related to uh, these theorems, definitely. Um, yeah, divergence theorem is definitely one of Maxwell's. Okay. It looks like the one for magnetism. Yeah, I can't remember exactly how those work. <clears throat> okay, so we did the um, triple integral. Now we want to do the double, double integral. And let, we have to notice a couple of things. We can speed up our work a little bit if we notice the following. Let's pick the surface. So we have all these surfaces. We have six of them. We have x equals negative one. We have x equals one. We have y equals negative two. We have y equals two. We have z equals negative three. And z equals three. So we have six surfaces. We have to parameterize each and find a normal vector for each. And let's just go through the, the and the only reason we parameterize is to find the normal vector. Because that's the key. Because we're going to take f and we're going to dot it with the normal vector. So if we can find the normal vector easily, we don't have to go through the whole parameterization process. Let's go through the parameterization process for one of them and notice a pattern, or maybe two. We'll notice a pattern. <laughs> so let's parameterize this surface. We have this plane that we're parameterizing. Okay. Well, what are we going to do? Negative one. Negative one. Negative one. Negative one. Negative one. So the x values in that plane are all negative one. But the y's and the z's can vary. So that's where the u's and the d's are going to come into play. That's going to give us our span of that, of that plane. So then we'll form r sub u and r sub v. r sub u is going to be 0, 1, 0. r sub v would be 0, 0, 1. And then we're going to cross them to get the normal here. Normal, you know, so we get 1 minus 0. We get uh, 0 minus 0. We get 0 minus 0. So we get that. How did, how did you pick R again? So we're parameterizing this plane. Just this, x equals negative 1. Yep, x equals negative 1. So that plane is, uh, is vertical, if you will. If we think of the x axis right. going down, we've got this plane. 
all, and in a plane, a surface is just a bunch of ordered triples. And that plane, that all the x values are negative 1, but the y's and the z's can be anything. So the u and the v represent the anything piece. And we can go any way the y direction and anywhere in the z direction, in the z direction. So that would be our parameterization. <coughs> that would be our u. So then our u, our v, and yeah. Let's do another one and just make sure that we're getting that. So if we plug in this surface right here, x equals 1 is the front plane of the rectangular box. And the normal vector that's going to come out, or excuse me, the parameterization, parameterization of this surface is just look like that. And then we do our, excuse me, our r sub u and our r sub v. So r sub u will be the same, r sub v. Do the same. So we get that. Across the right. Yeah. So does it matter in which direction these normal vectors go? It does. We have to be careful. So we have to go back and look. So we've created a normal, whether it's the right one to use, we always want to go back and read the problem. And so evaluate, they don't, they don't really say here. Um, they just say check for agreement. Uh, they don't really tell us. What should be true about the normal vectors? If we're going to do, if we're trying to measure flux through the surface here, what should be true about all the normals? Yeah, they should all point out. So this is a normal vector. This one in particular is pointing um, that one's pointing into the surface, though, because x equals negative 1 is the back plane, x equals plus 1 is the front plane. So this gives us a normal vector, but it's not lining up with the concept of the problem, which would be finding outward flux. So we're going to modify that one when we go to our print, when we actually go to plug into our integral. Definitely have to modify it. Now, the, let's do one more of these, and then we'll see the pattern at least. So for this one, where y is negative 2, hopefully you're kind of seeing this pattern here. We're going to do that. And then r sub u would be 1, 0, 0. r sub v will be r sub v will be 0, 0, 1. And when we find this normal vector, cross the x component, that's 0 minus 0. Middle component, 0 minus 1. Z component, 0 is 0. And so we get that. All right. So we kind of are seeing the pattern. It doesn't, the one thing up here we might not have been sure about was like, ooh, those are both 1, and we ended up with 1s here. Will that be the same case when we have 2s and 3s? And we see, oh yeah, we're just getting these unit normals, right? That you can kind of see clearly if you visualize it carefully. So, and our whole point here is that we, we want to make sure that we're um, not getting the wrong normal. And so, what this is telling us, we see the pattern of, oh yeah, well if we have these two planes that are x equals constants, we're just going to pick these normals that are out. The y's, we can pick the intuitive normals. The z's, pick the intuitive normals. Those will all work because they're lined up with RU cross RG. Okay, so we um, then are going to evaluate. So our surface integrals, let's start looking at those. So when we have x equals minus 1, what is that surface integral going to look like? So we have a double integral over the surface of um, f dot um, n yes. so that's our that's our flux right? this is this is measuring the flux this is measuring the normal component of f so with Stokes theorem we integrate the normal component of the curl of f with divergence theorem, we integrate the normal component of f. 
So the neural component of the curl is, is getting stuff around the boundary, the tangential stuff. Normal component of the field is getting perpendicular stuff. So this is measuring, this is getting the net effect of all the, the orthogonal components in the vector field. So our vector field, let's, we haven't even looked at that yet. So x squared, y squared, z squared. And when x squared, y squared, z squared, there's our parameterization. So x squared, y squared, z squared, we're going to substitute in the values that we have right here. So what's x squared become? What are we going to end up with? 1, and then u squared, v squared, right? 1, u squared, v squared, <coughs> dotted with. So now we want to make sure so with the two x's, when we found our r u cross r v, they're both pointing, you know, sort of forward, zero, uh, one zero zero. But if we want to measure outward flux for the whole collection of six faces, we need to turn that vector to make it negative one zero zero, so that we're getting the outward flux. So here we're going to turn it so that it's outward. And then the UDV. And when we did our parameterization, what I didn't write it up here, but what are the restrictions for U and V? Yeah, so the Y's are trapped between negative two and two, the Z's are trapped between negative three and three. So when we put those in here, we're going to go to U like out of there, and V was negative three and three. Okay. And lo and behold, we end up with This interval is 4, the length of this interval is 6, so 24, that's minus 24. And let's notice what we get when we look at the front surface. Unless somebody has a question, if you have a question, ask. So there's no <coughs> u and no v, so we get 2 minus minus 2 and 3 minus minus 3. Six and four and multipliers. Then notice what we get when we do positive one. So with positive one, the integral of the normal components. They look real similar. Vector field's the same, I believe. Let's double check that I didn't lie you. So vector field is there. Now, for our parameterization for x equals 1 is right there. Squaring those is the same as squaring those, so our vector field is the same. The only difference is that the outward normal is the normal 1, 0, 0. Okay. So here, we end up with, what do we end up with here? Yeah. So here we end up with 1, the u, v. Here we end up with positive 24. So we see that the flux, the outward flux through one is negative 24. Outward flux through the front is positive 24. Those add to zero. So the net flux through the x planes is zero. The same pattern is going to hold for the planes that are y equals negative 2 and positive 2 is equal to negative 3 and positive 3. The same pattern is going to hold. So we're going to get a net flux through the x's is 0, the net flux through the y's is 0, the net flux through the z's is 0, so our total flux is going to be so total outward flux or inward flux for that matter, will be 0. Which is exactly what we got when we used the divergence theorem and integrated the triple integral of the divergence over the inside. Okay. 
So, and this is very similar to that one that you were doing. <coughs> that one did have a, have a plug. Yeah, that one, yeah, it did. It was ugly. <laughs> it was ugly. Yeah, that one had a funk. That they, they didn't all cancel out. But the, the way that you parameterize your, your, your walls, identical. And the normal vector is identical. So it's all, that's all going to match up. It's just like yeah, e, to the, e to the mass plus e to the mass. <laughs> it's going to be a little messy. Alright, so let's do this one. That one was just because the normal vector has zeros in it that it canceled out. Yeah, yeah. The, the, this one is, this one. This one is more gross. Yeah, the one that you're dealing with is just not as nice. Okay. Um, and the vector field here is just a lot easier. Yeah. Your vector field, you know, here we have a quadratic. You pick the, you know, when you. If you that one was e to the minus x yeah, minus yeah. y. Yeah, it's, it's just messy. <laughs> Last call. <laughs> 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 oh, D. You like how better than me? They both have beautiful infinite series representations. Oh. Okay. No Talk about that. <laughs> okay. Please. Please show it. Is that what you said? Equation proof, uh, that proof is beautiful. Okay, first, expression for pi, you can get that number, pi squared over 60. <laughs> All right, so find, uh, here we have a rotation field. So notice that with this rotation field, you're going to get this rotation field um, when the corresponding component doesn't have the corresponding letter in it. So it's going to be more rotational than radii if the x component has no x, the y component has no y, and the z component has no z. Right? Like if you look at the vector field, which they call a, a you didn't call it, what do we call it? Um, right now. If you look at the vector field x, y, z, where the first component has x, the second component has y, the third component has z, that thing is radiating out. So there's not a lot of curl. Okay, so let's find the outward flux of this vector field across the boundary of this cube. So again, this is going to be a heck of a lot easier if we do the divergence theorem, especially when the divergence is zero. So rotational field, no divergence. Right? There's no x here, so when you take the, the partial with respect to x, you get zero. There's no y there, so the partial with respect to y is zero. No z in the third component. So this one, the triple integral of the divergence of f, v, v. That's the right so in this case, it's zero. Right. It's not easy. <laughs> when in doubt, <laughs> when in doubt, write a bunch of symbols and an equal sign and a zero. Put a box around it. That's like a zero set problem. So now, if we wanted to go with the faces, we would have to do a very similar thing to what we did before. And let's just go back and look at the previous one for a second. Now this one, uh, when we found the divergence here, so here the divergence was definitely not zero, but we still ended up with, I guess it was on the same page, we still ended up with an outward flux of zero. Right, so this is one of those conservative vector field types of things. Just because the flux is zero doesn't mean there's no divergence. It just means there's balance. There's just as much coming in as there is going out. You know, right? when, we, when we find the net flux, there's just as much leaving as coming in. Okay, so, yeah. You know, we could do some faces here if we have time. Let's, let's get this one out. Let's get this one out. So here, use the divergence theorem to compute the net outward flux of the following 
vector field across the surface path. So here we're dealing with the unit cube, the unit cube in the first octet. And if we take the divergence here, the x component is the only component that contributes to the divergence because there's no y in the second component and no z in the third component. So the divergence is just 2x. And again, we could parameterize each of those six faces and calculate the outward flux. And we, we now know that if we wanted the outward normal for up here, we could just go 0, 0, 1. The downward normal, 0, 0, negative 1. That normal, we would pick the y component, so 0, 1, 0, 0, negative 1, 0. So we could parameterize each face and use those normals. That would work fine. But it's going to be a lot easier if we calculate the total flux with the triple integral of the divergence. So D is the solid cube, and we're going to do a triple integral of that function. That function is defined throughout the cube. So this is going to collect and get a net divergence. And then the stuff that's diverging from the inside that's passing through the boundary is called the flux. So volume leaving the inside per unit of time must equal the amount passing through the boundary per unit of time. So let's deal with this pretty straightforward because all the limits are 0 to 1. <coughs> And it doesn't matter which direction we go. Z, dy, dx. It doesn't matter. We're all going to be one. There is no z. That is good. The inner integral goes away. There is no y either, right? So doesn't this all just boil down to the integral of 2x, dx? All going to boil down to that. So that's x squared, 0 to 1. Sounds good. Sounds good. We got that going for us. There is outward flux. There is a net outward flux. So it doesn't mean that it's positive flux in each of the six space directions. It just means overall, the balance is more going out than coming in. So Five of them could be negative, and then one is so, you know, so positive that there's more outward flux overall. Yeah? Did you find the direction of this? What's that? Well, the, the net flux going out, is there like a direction point at all? It's just radiating out. Just, they just talk about the contraction or expansion of the vector field, you know, like some jellyfish. Okay. So, the jellyfish is, you know, more is going out than coming in. Okay. Jellyfish. I saw some crazy science show last week where they were trying to model a jellyfish and how it how efficient it swims. Trying to model a jellyfish is not easy. That's a tough problem. Because it's so efficient the way it swims, so they're trying to create, you know, like a, a, a marine device that swims that efficient. And they're like ninety-nine percent water too. Like All right, so you guys ever watch Outrageous Acts of Science? That show is so good. It's funny. Yeah, there was one we watched, my kids and I watched last week. These guys invented these, these um, <coughs> flying devices, and they were flying all over the place like birds. Crazy. What? Total control. No, they weren't flapping. Oh. You know, they went, I'm trying to remember how they did it. They created some sort of... They had to have enough speed, so they had to be jumping out of a plane in order to get it to go. But then they could step in the air for hours and hours with these with these suits and these little controllers. That was crazy. Was this a jetpack thing that I saw that it was like this like personal jet? Thing? It's different than the jetpack. The jetpack one you could take off from the ground. This one they had to jump out of a plane, and then they had enough enough momentum that they could maintain flight for hours. It was pretty. Gliding, but they're going up, down, turning, whichever way they want. Yeah, they were, yeah, yeah, yeah. But not, nothing big, though, not like a big hang glider or anything. Small little pack. 
<clears throat> All right, so here we've got, we have a cone, and we want to use the divergence theorem. So if we were going to use the surface integral part, we would have to find two surface integrals, out of the cone and out of the cap, the flat <coughs> cap. But if we use the divergence theorem, we can just integrate the divergence of the vector field throughout the inside of the cone. That's going to be a lot faster. So the surface area of a cone, or excuse me, the volume of a cone, just remember, is one third pi r squared h. Divergence is easy here. One plus one plus one? Three. Times 17 divided by 17. <laughs> Okay. All right, so we're going to set up a triple. So the outward flux is the triple integral over the solid object of the divergence of the vector field throughout that volume, throughout the solid. We find the, the, we find the divergence to be constant. And this tells us then that our final answer is three times the volume of the cone. Three times the volume of the cone. <coughs> so this is three times volume of the cone. That's one third times pi times r squared a. So what's r squared here? So z is going all the way up z zero to four. So this top circle up there is going to be sixteen equals x squared plus y squared. So the radius will be four. And the height will also be four. So we just have to make sure we're getting the fours in the right place. So we end up with 64 pi. So there's a net positive flux, so that means there's the, the vector field is expanding. More leading the inside of the cone. Make sense? Ooh. Oh, okay. Gotta pick one now. Uh, so to do the integral plot line, it would be uh, two d squared pi. The limit would be two d pi. That's good. Yeah, that's good. So we have two different surfaces here. If we want to find the outward flux, we have to parameterize each. And then we have to make sure that we pick a normal that is in the right direction. So let's go ahead and um, let's do it. So let's take that. I think I started to get what's going on. However many months later, it's been. so it's actually let's get the picture also just because it did such a nice job. Okay. So let's go ahead and we'll call the cone piece of it, we'll call that surface one, we'll call the cap surface two. So let's go ahead and do the cap first because that looks easier. So we need to, if we're going to do the surface integral version of the divergence theorem, we have to find the parameterization of that surface. Whenever we integrate, whenever we do a surface integral, we need to parameterize our surface. So what we said was that we had x squared plus y squared equals 16. So how is that parameterization going to look then? 
Surface is z equals four, and v v there is just your radius. So regardless of what the radius is, it's still right. Yeah, that doesn't matter. But <coughs> that normal vector is changing, right? It's changing throughout the surface, which I guess is fine. Because normally we have normal vectors that are varying. Bless you. So because of a I was thinking that we were going to get 0, 0, 1 because the plane is e equals 4, and so that's given to us as a surface. And we should get the same normal vector regardless of how we parameterize the surface. Since we're just going to dot it anyway, though, does it matter what it turns out to be? Because we're finding f in the direction of that vector, and the direction of the change of that value. Well, we'll find out. <laughs> Except that we'll probably have, I need to think in my head for a second there, though, because something seems off. Because we should, like I showed you at the beginning of the class, if we're doing, if we're parameterizing a surface, and we do R U cross R V, and the surface is given to us as a function, we should get the same exact normal vector. Right? That's what we did the first slide of the class. We were saying, oh, you can pick RU cross RV, or if the function, if the surface was a function, then you could use minus e sub x minus e sub y comma one. And I, I need to reconcile that in my head for a minute here. It, does our parameterization make sense here? Is that really giving us? I guess the difference is that it's not it's not the Plane. I guess the difference when we at the beginning of the class was that we had our plane, but here we have. 
have a portion of a plane that we're using, that we're restricting. Let's go to the plane. I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning for one moment. So if we Get a bunch of those to double check, and every single time I got that. That point is equal to four. Well, let's just see what we get. Let's see what we get. Okay, so instead of doing divergence, we're going to do the surface integral of f dot n ds over this. This one is S2. Let me figure out what that is. So that is the N that we're dotting with F. Let's take a look at F. So we parameterize according to that. So we have to plug those in. So we're going to get double integral of basically, it's going to look exactly like that, right? So V cosine of U comma V sine of U comma 4. And then we're dotting it with RU cross RV. And now this integral is over A, or over R. And we dot that together, everything vanishes except the Z component. So we get the double integral of minus 4 V. <coughs> Let's do our DA. This circle of radius, uh, yeah, circle of radius four down in the xy plane. How do we want to indicate that? We have you. I guess actually we don't need to convert it to polar, do we? We already know what the limits on v and u are. We have our limits right there. So the U limit, so all actually, yeah, let's not convert. We don't need to do it. We already have limits. So U is 0 to 2 pi. V is 0 to 4. So when we integrate this, there is no U, so we can pull this out and get minus 8 pi. Then we integrate with respect to V, and we get V squared over 2, 0 to 4. So 0, nothing, 16, 8, minus 64 pi. Okay, so what does that tell us in terms of the direction? It's going in, right? That's going in. So we have negative flux through here. We parameterize this. If we looked above, we parameterize it counterclockwise. And the, or did we parameterize it counterclockwise? Let's make sure. What's true about the normal here with those Vs? If we look at our normal vector here, R U cross R V, that's going, that's actually pointing down, right? So, so it's actually flux, that's actually, the flux going out is actually 64 pi. So it's actually reversed. So now let's parameterize the cone. So if we parameterize the cone, we should get, we should get the other particle. So how do we parameterize the cone? The cone is, we're calling S1. So that parameterization, how do we parameterize that? <coughs> so if we look up there at our equation, how can we parameterize the cone? That might actually be kind of tricky. So we have the same kind of thing. We have to do this where z squared is going to be, z is going to be found by taking the square root of that. Maybe this is why they told us to use the original thing, because this is going to be a little bit messy. So z is going to be the square root of the sum of the squares. So parameterizing the cone, what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. We could do that. Will that work? No, that's not going to work. 
that would be then giving us a square boundary in the xy plane. We have to use a cosine and a sine to make sure that we get a round boundary. So we have to do something like u cosine of b, <coughs> u sine of b. That'll give us a disk in the xy plane, but then we have to lift it up. And we have to make sure that the relationship fits. So this needs to be the square root of that squared plus that squared, which is what? Yeah. Are you ready? It's you. So let's see if we do our r sub u cross r sub v to get our normal. So here we have cosine v, sine v, one, and then r sub v minus u sine v. And then for uh, differential derivative, derivative with respect to v, so we get that, and then cross them, ru cross rv. First component is minus u cos v. Second component is minus u sine v. Third component, u cosine squared plus u sine squared. That's just u. So there's our parameterization. And we're going to do the double integral of f dot n dS through s2. So now we have to take our vector field and plug in our components for the parameterization. So capital F, what was it again? Oh, it's just like B. So our parameterization is right there. So X, Y, Z. Dotted with n, which is r u cross r v. Then let's get our limit straight. U d v. U is outside, so that's representing the radius of the disk, so zero to four. V is on the inside, representing full rotation, zero to two pi. Dot those two together. Get. Put them together. Minus u cosine squared. No, minus u squared. So it is. Put the d u and d u in the squared. U. So the, in this parameterization, v is representing the. Oh, yeah. Yeah, why did I? Thank you. Yeah, U is representing the radius of the disk, so that should be zero. Yeah. <coughs> How I dyslexia of that. Two, five, four. All right, so we're going to get some cancellation here. So we get minus U squared cosine squared, and then we get minus U squared sine squared, and then we get plus u squared, e to the b. And that simplifies to factor out the minus e squared. Oh, what do we get there? Zero. zero. Uh -oh. it has to be. Yeah. Well, we wanted the total to be zero. Yeah, we wanted to be zero. Uh, so it's total to be zero. Yeah. Because the first oh, section yeah. was 64. It scared me. I was thinking we wanted the total to be zero. That's right. The other thing was 64, though, so, right? Okay, so we got zero. And so then the one caveat is that the way we parameterized this with our normal vector was that that was a downward normal, not an outward normal. So we should, if we want the outward flux, we just reverse the sign and we get 64 pi. And then. 
matches that. Low and behold. All right, well, let's stop there. It's 5 o'clock. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so Wednesday.